The best way to do wildlife photography is with a cup of tea. Hello and welcome back to a Lockdown Masterclass. I'm Raj K and I'm going to take you through some wildlife photography. For this video I'm going to be focusing on uh, wildlife you can find nearby. So whether that's a small drive away or uh, in your back garden, it's all things that are close to you and I think you'll be able to find far more than you realise just on your doorstep. As with all aspects of wildlife photography, um, trying to photograph stuff like this, particularly in your local area, uh, takes time and patience and particularly requires you to um, get to know your local area really intimately. I'm guilty of not really knowing my local area that well. I've not lived here very long, so that's my excuse. But when we go for walks, we tend to pick a place that we drive to and then go for a walk around there rather than get to know what's around just down the road from our house. And it was only during lockdown that we managed to find any of these walks. But I haven't spent enough time walking and observing, and particularly at these times of day when um, things are a bit quieter uh, and the wildlife has been a little bit less disturbed. Because even with all the best technique in the world, unless you have the patience uh, for trying to find this, your subjects, um, you're just not going to end up with any good images. Once you start photographing wildlife, the main things to consider are the light and the composition. So picking a time of day where the light's great really makes a difference. Um, you kind of want it to be a little bit overcast if you're photographing during the middle of the day. That way you're getting a bit of a softer light and you're not going to get those harsh shadows. So a, a lightly overcast day works great. Or photograph early in the day or late. So uh, I'll be getting up nice and early to try and photograph some of the birds and staying late so towards sunset. During these times of day, the birds are hungrier, they're out looking for food, um, so you're more likely to get some great images. That's not always the case. Today I've been photographing uh, throughout the middle of the day because the birds in this garden are always really active uh, right in the middle of the day for some reason. And then you want to look at the composition, so make sure that your backgrounds aren't too cluttered, there's no fence posts coming out, um, no wires, no buildings behind. Uh, you want something quite soft and green. Um, however you set it up, as long as it's not distracting from the main subject. Often with wildlife you can neglect the foreground, but having some foreground mush can really make a difference to the image and give it a sense of depth. With wildlife in your garden you have an opportunity to set something up to get a really lovely image. So you can use some bird feed or some peanut butter. A lot of animals love peanut butter for some reason, it's just it's a, it's a universal truth. This. Um, you can put that out for them and, and hopefully they'll go and feed on that in exactly the position that you want to shoot them in. But as with all wildlife, be considerate of the environment that you're in uh, and don't feed them things that they're not supposed to eat. That does mean you can set up the camera, um, lock the autofocus and actually shoot from inside the comfort of your own home. So you can set the camera up, pointing at a perch near a bird feeder, turn on the Wi-Fi and see the, what the camera is seeing on your smartphone and then sit by the fire with a glass of wine and take a picture from in the house. You could also use one of the Bluetooth remotes if your camera has that, uh, or use the uh, flash system. So you can set up a flash on the camera and just tell it to take a picture using the Canon flash system uh, without actually the flash firing, so you're not disturbing the wildlife. If you're really into wildlife, um, you'll probably know this isn't the best time to be making a wildlife uh, photography video, as it's sort of an in-between time for a lot of insect life uh, and a lot of bird life. I'm currently lying down in Jade's family's garden because it's just down the road from us and we have a lot more options for wildlife here. We live in a small mid-terrace house with a tiny little garden but that's not to say you can't get a lot of wildlife in there. Over the summer we've had nesting uh, blue tits, we've had nesting great tits, we've had uh, baby starlings, we've had hedgehogs, um, we've had all sorts. We even had a sparrowhawk very briefly and um, incredibly violently. 
given I've only got a few days to film this video, uh, I've come to this garden because it's slightly bigger and also um, it's a little bit more remote in the countryside. So uh, you see a lot of wildlife here on a daily basis. In fact, this afternoon I missed a uh, buzzard uh, trapping a baby rabbit, which is slightly unfortunate. If I manage to photograph anything that epic, it'll be a miracle. Um, however, I'm going to give it a go and just photograph things I know to be here quite regularly. But what I'm going to do is show you some tricks um, to get the best out of your garden wildlife. So we all have bird feeders uh, and we've all seen shots of birds on bird feeders and they're very rarely any good. Uh, it just looks a bit rubbish, particularly if the bird feeder's in a position where it's got a cluttered background or even if it's just the sky as a background that's not particularly interesting. Often it can be quite silhouetted so the birds are quite um, dark and you just get the shape of them. The bird feeders aren't particularly attractive either. What I've done here is I've just, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a spot where they are regularly fed, um, these birds, there's a, a bird feeder there, a couple of bird feeders, and um, I've just put a tree stump down the bottom, put sprinkled some bird seed on there. The, I'm, I'm very low down, so I'm going to be at the same level as the birds. Um, that way I'm not looking down on them, because that looks kind of strange, and also it's not a particularly not attractive shot when you're just photographing a bird uh, from above looking down, you can see all the bird seed and you can just see grass behind them. So from this angle getting low and getting to the same level as them, uh, we get a much nicer image, we get a bit more depth because the background can be nice and blurry um, and they can really pop and stand out a little bit better. I don't have to have the camera auto focusing constantly in between shots and also I can have it set up on a tripod so I can set it up here, I don't have to take the weight of it, I'm not holding it for hours and hours. Um, I just set it up, leave it on, and fire away every time a bird comes to the to the perch. I've already set the focus, so I've focused on a bird and it was sitting there um, for a couple of seconds, and then I've locked the focus, so I just turn it into manual focus, and now I can just photograph every time one goes there, and eventually you get you're bound to get a decent shot. So I set up the exposure based on the tree stump, uh, just set it up to manual, uh, set the aperture to around F. Well, I've got it set to F7, but it's F7, F8, something like that. Gives you a little bit of depth, gives you a little bit of flexibility if the, the bird's moving around on that um, tree stump. But also keeps the background nice and blurry. Now, because I've set this up, uh, all I have to do is sit here and wait. And because I'm so close to home, I can have a nice cup of tea. Not sure how much you can see this, but what I've done is just used a branch with a V shape to hold up another branch, much longer one. Um, it's going to be really close to the feeder. And then I'm just going to sit somewhere in a bush uh, nearby and try and photograph that. There's this pheasant I've been trying to photograph um, in this garden for a little while and um, he's very, very shy. He gets fed every day um, so he comes and calls for his dinner but he doesn't like me very much. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my camera up on a remote and uh, have it looking at the food and I'm just going to photograph it and I'm going to stay inside the house. And I've done that by using this. So this is a 600EX RT on the top of the camera. The camera's as low as I can get it, so it's just left it in the camera bag. He was fine with my camera bag earlier, so I'm just going to leave that here. Um, and then I'm going to trigger it using this. So every time I press this button, the camera takes a picture. I've set the exposure to what I want it to be, so we should be able to get some cool results um, shooting into the sun 
and get it uh, a backlit. I'm inside now, um, and uh, but I do have some great views, so I can see out. Um, so if the pheasant comes back, I will see it. It doesn't seem to mind us being in the house if we're looking out the window. He's not too bothered. Um, it's just that if we're outside, he freaks out and runs away. The camera's set up, and I've got my little trigger. Uh, so we'll see if we get anything. The other way you can do this is with your smartphone, which also gives you a lot more flexibility for being able to change the settings uh, and see what your camera is looking at from while you're in the house. So my camera is currently outside in my garden. Um, there's not much out there at the moment, but just to give you an idea. Um, and I'm in the house with my phone. I've turned the Wi-Fi on on the camera and all I'm gonna do is connect to the camera's Wi-Fi hotspot with my phone. As soon as that's done, I'll switch over to the Canon Camera Connect app. Um, and as soon as I open that app, it recognizes that camera. Click that and it will sort it all out and connect. Then I have the option to remote shoot or view the images that are already on the camera. I'm going to go into remote shooting for this and it will give me a live view of what the camera is seeing. So that's streaming from my garden to my desk. I can tap on the screen uh, as to where to focus and it will focus on that. I can change the exposure settings. And then I can press shoot. I've got the option of shooting single shot or in burst mode, so I can just hold the button uh, and shoot in burst mode exactly the same as you would if you were holding the camera in your hands. You can also switch it to video mode to quickly record video as well, uh, and you get full manual control of that as well. By default, it'll save the raw files to the camera and send you a small JPEG. This is a lot better way of doing it than using the flash system as it gives you a lot more control over the exposure and where your camera is focusing. However, it can be a little bit limited in terms of range. Um, so you can get around that by connecting it up to your home router if you're doing this in your garden um, and making sure that you've got uh, an aerial sticking towards your window. That way you get complete control of it from a lot further away. In my garden, it's not such a problem because I'm only a few meters away. Lens selection for wildlife photography is obviously particularly important. You want as much reach as you can possibly get out of your lenses. This is 100 to 400 adapted over to the EOS R and there's no disadvantage to using the EF lenses over on the R system. But there is 100 to 500 coming and that's going to give you a little bit more reach and a little bit faster focusing as well. <laughs> but if 400 isn't enough because you're going to want as much reach as you can possibly get, uh, you can actually put extenders in. So you can put a 1.4 or 2 times extender uh, in between the lens and the camera body. The downside to doing that is you're gonna lose one stop of light or two stops with a two times extender. And on DSLRs, you might struggle to focus or not be able to struggle uh, focus at all. That is one of the advantages of mirrorless cameras because they can focus even at F22, uh, especially on the R5 and the R6. So you're gonna get a lot more flexibility for getting long lenses. The other thing is not Adapters aren't always uh, compatible with every lens. The maximum most DSLR autofocusing systems are rated to is f8, so if your maximum aperture is smaller than f8, then you're going to run into some problems. For example, if you put a 2 times extender on a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, you're not going to get autofocus on a 5D Mark IV or any other DSLR. You will, however, if you do the same thing and put it on a mirrorless body because the mirrorless bodies are able to focus down to f22 on the newest ones. With that reduction in light, you need to factor that into your exposure. So your shutter speed is gonna to have to increase or you're gonna to have to up your ISO. But with wildlife photography, exposure is only one part of a much bigger challenge. Your bigger issue is gonna be autofocusing. So I'm gonna show you some tips on how to get the best out of your autofocus system. And this is where an advanced autofocus system really comes into play. 
So I'll show you some techniques on how to get the best out of yours. Setting up your autofocus system for different types of subjects really makes a difference. You wouldn't necessarily have the camera set up for a deer or uh, a bird that you know is going to be fairly stationary or you know where it's going to be compared to a bird in flight or um, something moving far more erratically. So it makes sense that your camera should be prepared for the type of subject that you're going to be photographing. Hey chicken, are you going to come and join me? I don't know if you can see the chicken. Hey Summer, are you chicken bombing me? <laughs> Welcome Summer everybody. New Canon mascot. The first thing I'm going to show you is back button focus. You might have heard of back button focus. Um, you might already shoot like that. Fair warning, it does take a little bit of getting used to if you've never done it before, um, and you might initially really hate it. I did when I first set up back button focusing, um, and then eventually it just suddenly clicked and it all made sense and now I can't go back. All back button focuses is taking away the control of focusing from this front shutter button where your index finger goes. So by doing that, you're using that button entirely for metering and taking a picture, that's it. And because I'm shooting in fully manual, the metering isn't a consideration anyway, so it's just taking a picture. So why you wanna do that? Uh, you might have set up a, a little perch that you know a bird's gonna to go to, or you're expecting an animal to go to a particular place, and you can pre-focus, so I just press the back button to focus on that thing, and then I let go. As soon as I let go, the camera's not gonna focus again. I can wait for the subject to come into the frame and go to exactly where I think it's gonna go, and then I can take a picture, and the camera isn't gonna hesitate at all. So what happens when, you're, when you've got focus on here is as soon as you hit that button, the camera's gonna try and just check the focus and then take a picture. But if you've already pre-focused, it doesn't need to do that. So it's just wasting a little bit of time. So this just gonna remove that lag. And apologies if you're already familiar with back button focus, I am gonna show you how to set it up but there are some advanced tips in this as well that you might not have heard of. So on the 5D Mark IV, I'll show you where this is. From the uh, info screen here, we're gonna hit Q and go to custom controls. It's over here on the right-hand side. If you're on a mirrorless body, all you have to do is press uh, info until you see this screen and then press Q and you will see this custom control uh, option. It is also in the menus, so if you need to find it in the menu, it's under the orange menu, the custom controls bit. I'm going to hit that, and that symbol there is the shutter button. So we're going to go into there, and I'm just going to turn off autofocus. The AF on button is already doing the AF and the metering, so I don't need to change anything. It's already set up for that. So now the shutter button's only doing the shutter, and the AF on button is doing the AF, which makes a lot of sense. So here's a clever trick that you can do with some Canon cameras uh, with back button focus. I can actually go in and set up different behaviors on different buttons to have multiple back button focuses. So if I go into this one here, that's the AF on button. Um, it's already set up to be AF, but I can actually hit info down the bottom and I can set up a very specific um, characteristic or a very specific setup for that button so I can go in and say that I want it to be set up for erratically moving subjects uh, and I want it to be on servo and I want it to be a wide area and then all I have to do is press menu to go back out so that's that one I can also set up the auto exposure lock button because I shoot in fully manual I never use this button it's completely irrelevant to me so I might as well set it up to be something more useful. I can go in, press Q, uh, go to that star button, set that up to metering and AF, and then press info again. And I can set this one up to be something a little bit more predictable. So uh, case one, which is, um, or oh, actually case two, something uh, for, for quite predictable motion. And then I will go into servo still and perhaps just spot AF. 
So you see I've got two setups, one for very erratically moving subjects using a wide area still on servo, and then one for um, slightly more predictable moving subjects with a single point. This way I can switch between different subject matter very quickly uh, without having to go in to change settings. So other things with autofocus, if I hit this button, I can show you that we have, uh, on the 5D Mark IV, we have quite a few different options for zones, good options for different types of subjects. But what I do tend to find is as you get better at tracking moving subjects, you kind of want to narrow down um, the number of points that you're using. That way you can frame up where you want the subject in the, in the shot um, and then track it within that small area. So in terms of focus operation, we have one shot, AI focus and AI servo. AI focus is a hybrid between uh, one shot and servo. I don't personally ever use it and I don't know many people that do. It's maybe worth a go and see if it works for you, but servo does uh, a great job for most things, particularly if you're using back button focus. When you're using back button focus, it makes sense to be shooting in servo because you can tell it to stop focusing by just releasing the button. The last thing to show you with autofocus is in the AF menu. We have six case studies here. This was introduced um, in one of the 1DX series cameras um, and has come in with the uh, 5D Mark IV and quite a few others as well, including the R5 and the R6. So it's worth having a look at these. What this does is sets up the camera to behave slightly differently depending on the subject matter that you're using. It doesn't matter what, how many points you're using, all of these will affect it in some way. So what Canon have done is set up uh, six example cases um, and you can tweak them individually as well. I highly recommend if you're just learning about these uh, to stick with the set case studies um, and see how they differ for you and if it improves your uh, hit rate and then tweak from there once you're familiar and comfortable with them. To give you a little bit of an idea of what they're doing, tracking sensitivity doesn't speed up the initial pickup of your autofocus. None of these make your focusing much faster to pick up the, the subject initially. Um, it doesn't quite work like that. But what it does do is when you're tracking a moving subject, tracking sensitivity will affect how quickly it changes the uh, plane of focus. So for example, if I'm tracking a moving subject across and uh, say it's a bird and I'm tracking it across and a tree comes in between me and that bird, if you have the tracking sensitivity on quite low, what it will do is ignore the tree for a certain period of time. That way when the bird comes out the other side, it's still at that plane of focus and it's ready to continue tracking that subject. If you have it on really high, it's going to change from the bird to the tree and then try and go back to the bird afterwards. So you can see that you might lose uh, focus on the bird and it will be hunting again afterwards. So understanding that uh, gives you an idea of how the camera is going to behave uh, given the type of subject you're trying to track. Another example for this would be a subject that you know is coming directly towards you. You want the traffic sensitivity quite high for that because it's changing plane of focus quite quickly. The next one is acceleration and deceleration tracking. What this is going to do is prepare the camera for changes in direction and also uh, subjects that are going to be stopping or starting quite quickly. The last one is AF point auto switching. This only really applies to the slightly larger zone, so not one point uh, or spot AF, but anything with more than one focus point selectable and allows the camera to uh, change between those points that you have selected a little bit quicker particularly important with erratically moving subjects. So, as an example, if we're photographing a bird in flight um, that's quite high up against a plain sky, um, we don't actually need to have the camera on a single point because trying to keep that point on that bird in flight is quite difficult. But because the camera has very little to focus on other than that bird, we well, can actually just have it on the full wide area um, and have the camera 
complete control of the autofocus and it's likely to track that across all of the points, even if you keep the camera pretty stationary. If your subject is against a more complicated background, like uh, amongst the branches and trees, then you're going to want to narrow those down to a few focus points and try and track that subject and keep those points on the, on, on the bird. <laughs> you don't necessarily need a really long lens for wildlife photography. And if you live in the city, you don't need to go out to the countryside to find wildlife. You can just come to your local park. With wildlife this tame, when they're used to being fed and used to being around humans, you can get pretty close and get those really close detail shots. On the R, things change a little bit. Because the R is a mirrorless camera and you're effectively always in live view, the focusing system is completely different. On the R, we're using the dual pixel AF system, which means there's no individual focus points. It just covers most of the sensor. So that means you can move those points anywhere around on the camera, which means we can track subjects way off into the corners of the frame and you can really create some unusual compositions. But with all that flexibility, it does become a little bit overwhelming in terms of how you control where it's gonna be focusing. So similarly to the 5D, we have one point, we have uh, an expanded area, uh, expanded area around that, um, zone AF, um, which covers a nice big uh, chunk of the sensor, then you have two large zone AFs, one vertical and one horizontal. The last one is uh, face and tracking. Now I don't have shooting samples of the R5 and the R6 so I can't show you this, but on the R5 and the R6 the face tracking system works by tracking the face of the birds uh, and it will track birds, dogs and cats at the moment which is pretty incredible. It can actually eye track uh, track the eyes of those animals and uh, it can do them even if they're quite small in the frame um, and it does so even in really tricky lighting situations. On the R it doesn't go quite to that level but what it's doing in this mode is using the entire sensor to focus. So in this mode you are leaving a lot down to the camera and you're expecting the camera's algorithm to differentiate between uh, the trees, the leaves and the birds uh, or the subject or whatever your subject is. 
uh, and that's quite a big ask. So I generally recommend using one of the other modes. So you narrow it down to a certain area of the frame and then you track it within that area. There is, however, a nifty trick to use this mode, um, but with a little bit more accuracy. So we can hit menu and we go across to the AF menu And I'm going to go into initial servo AF point for face tracking. Uh, at the moment it's automatic, so where it first starts is automatic. It's going to pick out something. And generally with these algorithms it tends to be the closest thing to you. Um, obviously if you're putting a little bit of foreground mush in, um, that can cause a bit of confusion. In that menu I'm going to change it to one of these. So AF po point, so the second one down, so the second one down uh, is essentially taking where your start point is for any other mode and then bringing that over. So you'll use whatever mode you're in, uh, whether it's like spot or the largest expanded area and starting in that. Um, I tend to start with a single point. So initial AF point set for face uh, tracking at the top. And if you have the touch and drag AF set up, um, which is over here, uh, enabled, and I've set that to the right hand side of the screen. I'm then able to use the touch screen to drag the AF point to where I want it. When I have it up to my eye, I can bring that up to my eye and move that focus point as I move my thumb across the touch screen. It won't do it at the moment because I'm connected to HDMI, um, so it just ignores that. What that does is it gives me a focus point anywhere in the frame that I want. It'll track that thing that I've just clicked on. So as soon as I hit that, I'm going to hit the AF on button on that rotten apple, and then it's going to track that across the frame. So you can imagine you can do that for any uh, subject, like uh, a deer for example, and it will track that deer across the landscape. As I said, the AFK studies from the uh, 5D Mark IV are on the R5 and the R6, but there are fewer of them, and there is a new one called Auto, so it automatically selects which case study to use based on the subject matter. On the original R, there isn't case studies, but there, there is the option to um, adjust those variables manually, so all three of those variables are there in the AF menu. You can also set up these mirrorless bodies to have back button focus in the same way, and you can even customize uh, one button to do one type of back button and another to do a different one, uh, much in the same way you can on a DSLR. Wildlife photography is not without its dangers. That little dude just drew blood. That is a workplace injury right there. Because these birds are so tame uh, and you can get so close, it's kind of worth trying to use a macro lens uh, and getting some really close up detail shots of their feathers and the textures of the feathers and their eyes. It just gives you a perspective that you wouldn't normally get of such a beautiful bird. If you can avoid it, you don't want to get the seed in their mouths. So wait until they look up and they're done eating and they're looking around. And then focus right in on the eyes and get some shots.
My last tip is to get to know your wildlife. The more you know about the subject matter you're going to be photographing, the more likely you are to be able to predict where it will be so you can find it easier and not waste time walking endlessly through the woods trying to find them. And you're more likely to be able to predict where they're going to go so you can get ahead of your subject and photograph it in a position where you have a little bit more control over what the background is going to be and what your composition is going to be. And don't be afraid to experiment. You could, for example, set up off-camera flash next to a perch if you know the bird's going to be there to get something quite unique. Or if your subject is moving, try some slow shutter speed stuff. So slow that shutter speed down and pan with your subject. It'll take a lot of experimenting, but you can get some really incredible images like that. Most importantly, be respectful of the animals and be respectful of their environment. That's it, thank you for coming to join me. I'm gonna leave you with a slideshow um, during which you can ask me any questions in the live chat. Um, and if you missed that or you're re-watching this, you can always send me a message on Instagram, um, at rajk.photo. Uh, I'm also on YouTube too, so you can have a look there. Also a massive thank you to Jade and Luke, without whom this wasn't even possible, um, helping me film and helping me find all the birds. Thank you very much. Love to see you, goodbye.